And the first topic uh, is this idea of characterization tests, which again, if you ever read one single book on legacy code, it should be uh, dealing with legacy code by Michael Feathers. A lot of the ideas that are in this course are adapted from that book, shamelessly so. Uh, and in particular, the idea of characterization tests. And the motivation here is uh, we've always said that uh, code without tests is bad. And if you don't have tests because you have a legacy code base, um, then you're sort of in this catch-22 because if you don't understand the code base, how do you write tests for the code base? But if you don't have tests for the code base, you cannot safely make changes to the code. So how do you sort of get out of this, uh, uh, how do you get out of this bootstrap problem? And the answer is characterization test, which is basically just as when you're playing around with a legacy app that you inherit uh, in some condition, and by playing around with the app, you're getting an idea of what the app does today, you could actually capture all those same things in tests. And then you get uh, more coverage, it makes the behaviors repeatable, and it will start giving you some confidence that if you do this in the parts of the code you're going to have to modify, that you will be protected by tests when you start doing it. Uh, so before I give an example, I will say, um, just like I said with when you're doing branch per feature, you've established a branch for a particular feature, resist the temptation to do anything other than that feature on the branch. Same idea here. If you're going to write a characterization test for something, uh, resist the temptation to make any changes or improvements to the app. The whole goal of what we're going to do with characterization tests is capture the way the app works today, even if that behavior is sometimes buggy or something like that. So a characterization test, the simplest version of it that you can imagine, is kind of the same thing that a user would do. If you're sitting down with a customer or someone who knows the app, or even if you're playing around with the app yourself, and you're essentially stimulating the app in various ways to see what comes back. And you could do this uh, you know, just the same way. You could capture this in a cucumber scenario because, as we know, the whole point of a cucumber scenario is to essentially do the things a human user would do if they were interacting with the app. So if you can go through a particular workflow in the app and you sort of verify that it has a certain behavior, you can now script that workflow. You can capture it in a pretty high-level cucumber test and in, at first, you can do one of those really detailed step by step. You know, I fill in this, I fill in this, I click that. The kind of cucumber test that, in general, you want to avoid. But at this stage, it's a useful way to just automate the thing that you have just manually done. So you did some workflow with the app. It increased a little bit your understanding of what that part of the app does. Write a cucumber scenario that, that makes that repeatable. Later on, you can clean up that scenario. And you can convert it to higher level steps, or you can improve the background and given steps. Um, as you come to understand how the app works a little bit. So for example, uh, we, when we were doing Cucumber, we did an example showing that uh, if you had a given uh, or a set of background conditions like a new movie exists, and then you're going to go use that movie in the test, there's at least two different ways that you could cause that new movie to exist. One of them is you could go through the exact sequence of steps that a human user would do to create a new movie. And that's, you know, whatever, seven or eight lines of Cucumber steps. or if you understand how the app works and how the movie model works, you could just have a single step definition that essentially shoves a new movie model right into the database and takes care of it that way. So what we're saying here is start out by doing it the first way because you know that works. And over time, as you come to be familiar with the app, you can maybe convert some of those steps to do it in a little more streamlined manner. Um, now, what do you do about unit or functional level characterization tests? Because here, the premise is you don't know the code structure of the application. Um, and you kind of can cheat by doing this. Uh, there's a screencast you can watch um, on the screencast website, but I'll sort of reiterate uh, in brief what it does. Um, imagine that you're trying to test a method that calculates sales tax, and you actually don't know how the method's supposed to work. You just know that it exists. Um, so you can start out with this kind of dummy spec, and you know, this is using constructs that you've already seen. right? We're going to create a, a mock double of something, um, and we're going to uh, you know, expect that this mock is going to respond to a message. OK, well, that won't work. So basically, uh, uh, hold on, wait a minute. OK, sorry, the, the order probably shouldn't be a mock. The idea is that we would 
you know, uh, using a factory or using the code in the app actually just create a new order. But the, so I, I will fix the typo in the slide after lecture. I apologize for this. Um, but the, what I'm trying to get across here is that essentially you don't know the internals of how this compute tax method works. That's the thing that you're trying to write a test for. And what this might reveal is that when you call compute tax, it in turn is calling this other helper function get total. So, okay, well now we're gonna enhance the mock and say that uh, if it calls get total, we'll just, we'll give it a fake total. Um, and we're still asserting that if it computes the tax on that total, there we go. Okay, now the example makes more sense. Um, the way we set this up is we're doing, we're mocking out the order, we're going to try to uh, compute the tax on it. So this is the, the actual message that uh, we're gonna call on a real object. Uh, when we try to call it, it turns out that that method tries to call another method called get total. Uh, so we're now going to give the order a way to return a default value for that method. We're going to try the test again, but we've sort of invented the value that we think compute tax should return. It is almost certainly wrong. Um, and when you run it, you'll probably get something like this, right? If it actually ends up calling the real compute tax method, um, the compute tax method will compute something legitimate, which doesn't at all match our invented value. But basically what you're doing is you're trying to trick the method into revealing its behavior. Um, and once you've tricked the method into revealing its behavior, you can actually hardwire that back into the test, and now you know how it works. So, you know, what, what is the cheat that's going on here? You're trying to get the method to reveal what it does by essentially saying, I expect the method to do something uh, that's totally bogus. You write a test for it, you stimulate the method, the method does what it's supposed to do, which does not match your bogus invented answer, but now you know what the answer should have been. So now you have a little bit of test coverage around this compute tax method so that in the future, if you have to modify it or other methods related to orders, you have a little bit more protection that you didn't break something. So that, that's the general idea of a characterization test, right? It's you, you actually get the app to do what it does now, whatever that is, even if maybe it's buggy. Um, and at whatever level, whether it's the cucumber level as seen by the user, or whether it's at the level of calling individual methods that might rely on helper methods, um, as you get the app to reveal its behavior at that level, then you capture that behavior and you hardwire it into the test. And a day may come when this test is no longer useful because you've had to rewrite the compute tax method or other methods that it depends on, but in the meantime, it serves as a piece of scaffolding that just assures you that at least you haven't changed what the app does now, right? If, that if you make changes to the app's current behavior, your tests will tell you about it. <clears throat> and in some sense, that's the goal of a test, right? It's to give you a protective blanket so that when you're making changes to the app, you do not accidentally break something that was already working, um, at least without being told about it instantly. So the idea of characterization tests is kind of a way to do code exploration. As you're getting to the parts of the code that you think are where you're gonna need to make some changes, that's where you wanna start writing specs and cucumber scenarios to get coverage around that part of the code, and you, you do it essentially by cheating, right? By writing tests that you know will fail getting the test to run, and then changing the test to be what the code does. That's kind of why I think of it as cheating. So given you know, this sort of general approach to things and comparing the kind of test that you might write at the cucumber level, what a user would do, versus the kind of characterization test you would write more at this level when you're trying to figure out how does a particular method actually work, 